Welcome and thank you for joining us today for conversations with Go On Girl Book Club. I am Linda Johnson, co-founder and president of Go On Girl Book Club. 2021 marks our 30th year as an organization who reads and supports authors from the African diaspora. These series of conversations with authors and people in the book publishing industry from editors to black booksellers are created to connect us all to the inner workings of book publishing. Go On Girl Book Club is a literary sisterhood of dedicated book loving and reading women in 51 chapters in 16 states and 40 cities across the country who read a variety of genres written by black authors. Today, we are in conversation with Go On Girl Book Club's 2018 New Author of the Year winner, Naima Koster. We are so excited to have her with us today. And I am going to turn it over to Ileana De La Rosa, who is going to be having the conversation with Naima. Enjoy. Good afternoon. Naima Koster is the author of What's Mine and Yours, an instant New York Times bestseller, as well as the 2018 New York, Go On Girl Book Club New Author of the Year Award winner. Her debut, Halsey Street, was the finalist for the 2018 Kirkus Prize for Fiction and long listed for the VCU Cable First Novelist Award. She also was the GOG Book Club 2018 New Author of the Year for Halsey Street. Naima's essays have appeared in the New York Times, Elle, Time, Quelle, The Paris Review Daily, The Cut, The Sunday Times, Catapult, and elsewhere. In 2002, 2020, she was named a National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree. Naima has taught writing for over a decade in community settings, youth programs, and universities. She's currently affiliate faculty in the low residency MFA program at Antioch University in Louisiana. Naima tweets as Safista and writes the newsletter, Bloom How You Must. She lives in Brooklyn with her family. Hello, everybody. Hi, Liana. Hi, sorry about that. I had a little Zoom glitch for a second. I no apologize. Worries. How are no you doing? Worries. I'm doing all right, all things considered. How about you? I'm doing well, thank you. I first wanted to start off by congratulating you for being an instant New York Times bestseller. How did you feel when you first found out and where were you at the time? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked where, where was I? I was at the playground with my daughter who is a toddler. She's almost two years old. So my, my editor called me and she was screaming with excitement and I was just chasing my daughter around the playground and trying to keep her from throwing herself like off the jungle gym. So I was very distracted and I, I didn't fully get it. Um, until afterwards when we sat down on the bench um, and I had a moment to let it sink in and it was, it was amazing. I wasn't um, counting on it. And uh, I've had these like wonderful charm publication experiences, but it's been difficult getting both of my books out into the world. Um, so being a New York Times bestseller was just amazing. Yeah, that is very amazing. And as you know, you were selected by Go On Girl Book Club back in 2018 as new author of the year. And yeah. I wanted to know how you felt when you found out that you were selected by our organization and presented with that award. Yeah, well, I was deeply moved and so grateful. 
Um, I was actually, it was right before, I think it was shortly before I gave birth that I found out, um, but it was wonderful. And it, it was encouraging to be supported in this way by this community. Um, I guess I've alluded to this already. I haven't always felt um, supported and encouraged by the publishing industry um, and publishing professionals, but my work um, has been championed by Black women and women of color. Um, and I'm deeply grateful for the ways that people have chosen to, to show up and to read. Um. So we're in the pandemic and it's been a little over a year now and you were able to release your new novel, What's Mine and Yours during this time. And typically authors go on book tours to promote their book. So in addition to the current virtual tours that you're doing, cities appear to be opening up. Do you think there'll be an opportunity that you'll be able to go on an in-person book tour soon? Or do you have any plans for that? I certainly hope so. There are no plans for it yet. There are a couple of literary festivals in June that there was a question of whether they would be in person or virtual. And it looks like they're gonna be virtual um, for right now. Um, so perhaps for the paperback tour, whenever that is, um, maybe in the UK, we'll see how things go, but there are no concrete plans yet. But I would love, I would love to get out on book tour. That would be really nice. Um, I actually enjoyed reading the book very much and it resonated with me, um, you and I have two things in common. We're both New Yorkers and consider ourselves Afro-Dominican. So I'll say, hey, Manita, how are you? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> bien, bien, aquí. <laughs> I am, yeah, great. Yeah, so I guess that leads me into, I, I wanna just delve into the book because you covered so many different topics and, and different themes. Um, as a New Yorker, um, you may be aware that the New York public school population is, is very diverse, one of the most diverse in the country. However, it's in terms of um, the school system, it's highly segregated by race and class. And I'm wondering if that inspired you to write about school integration in your book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, both of my parents were actually New York City public school teachers. They were educators. Um, and I, I went to New York City public schools, um, a public school until I was about 12 years old. Um, and my school was mostly other black and brown kids in, Fort, in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, I commuted from Fort Greene. And then when I was 12, I, I was a scholarship kid at a private all girls school um, on the Upper East Side. I did a program called Prep for Prep that, um, takes high achieving kids of color who meet certain income requirements, their families make below a certain amount and places them in private school. So I had this wild experience of remaining in New York, but going to two different New Yorks, like the world of home and then the world of the Upper East Side, the world of my extended family and then the world of school. Um, and in What's Mine and Yours, I think I channeled a lot of the feelings and observations that I had as a young person who felt aware of how um, lonely my position was, the kind of scrutiny that I was under from peers and from teachers, and also the pressure of having that kind of opportunity um, and all the things that come along with it. I felt very much as a young person that I had to prove that I belonged in the school that I'd been admitted to. Um, and it's been a long process of on learning that. So a lot of that went to the character of G. Yeah, so that's that's a good point to, to just delve into the, the topic of race, which you cover heavily in the book. And um, G has his experiences as a black kid in a predominantly white school. And then we have Lacey May's daughter, Noel, um, who's also at the school. And my question, I would like to know when you develop the three characters, um, Lacey May's daughters, they all presented differently, um, although they both had the same parents. What went into developing those different characters? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, I was thinking a lot about my Caribbean family. So um, my mom is from the Dominican Republic. My dad's family is from Curacao and from Cuba, but he was born in the United States. And so culturally, many of the things that I got from him were you know, related to the experiences of a Black American man growing up in New York City in the 50s and 60s. So I felt that in my own family, there were people who navigated the world very differently based on their color, um, based on the way that they were seen. And my family is one where siblings move through the world very differently and have very different experiences. And so I wanted to write about that. In the book, it's a little bit different because one of the sisters, Noel, is white presenting. Um, and that that isn't really, that's not the story of my family, but it is a story of many Latinx families. And so I wanted to explore that, like what kinds of tensions can exist in a family when people identify differently. And also how the way that you're seen and the way that you see yourself don't always align. Um, you know, it's the white presenting daughter in that family who is the one who longs the most for a connection um, with other people of color. I found that to be very interesting while reading because Noelle is the one who gravitated towards G, although her mom, Lacey May, was really adamant about keeping the school separate and not having her daughter um, interact with him. Did you incorporate your personal experiences growing up in school um, as an Afro-Dominican in New York City? I know New York City is very diverse, so our experiences may not be the same. However, you'd mentioned that you went to prep for prep. So mm -hmm. how was that transition going from a New York City public school to a predominantly white school? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it was rough. It was rough. I was on, you know, I was 12 years old, um, which in my mind, I thought, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a big girl now, but you know, now as a mom, um, I know how young that is. It was very difficult. Um, it, it was difficult being an outsider in terms of my race. Um, it was also difficult being an outsider in terms of family experiences. I felt that in my family, there were experiences that my classmates didn't have. So experiences of people um, dealing with violence and experiencing violence in their neighborhoods and in their homes, um, people struggling financially, issues related to migration, all of these things that I started to feel in that school were shameful and were the sorts of things that should be hidden or kept secret, which I think is partially why I turned to books and to writing sort of to express the things that were facts of my life and facts of the people around me um, to, to understand and without shame. Um, and then fortunately, like I graduated and <laughs> I went to college and was able to have community and I did have community and connections in the school, but it was a predominantly white environment. It was also a really wealthy environment. So as like a 12 year old girl from Brooklyn, I was like, oh, all white people are rich. And like, because that was my experience, I was like, they're, they're all very, very wealthy. Um, I recently had a conversation with the Afro-Dominican writer, Clavis Natera, who's wonderful, um, has a debut novel coming out next year. And something she said really struck me, which is she said that, you know, being poor or being broke in a wealthy environment, that in her experience, there's a kind of embarrassment that comes around that rather than, you know, at 12, having a deep understanding of intergenerational wealth and systemic racism and inequality. I had a sense, like people in my life talked to me, um, but I also, I think as a little girl was very much like, well, now that I'm here, I will go to college and become a doctor and then be rich and then, move my whole family up to the Upper East Side. Like that was the 12 year old fantasy that I had of what it meant to have this opportunity and to lead a good life. Um, that's no longer how I think about a good life or what I want for my family or myself. But I think that question of what makes a good life, who deserves it, um, what needs to be covered up so that you can be in the spaces where that's possible are themes very much in this book and also in my first. I agree. Um, you talked about violence and in the book, there's a part where 
G experiences violence in the school because um, not to spoil, but the book has been out. So hopefully um, our, our audience has read it. If not, definitely pick it up. It's a great read. The students have an issue with the integration and they beat G up and he has to, to deal with this. And, you know, his mom is trying to understand and, and Lacey May is against integration. And I, I just wanted to understand, or if you can explain, Robbie, who's her daughter's father, he's Colombian. And I was trying to understand the intricacy of how, you know, Lacey May does not see her daughters. Um, she looks at being, I guess, Colombian or half Latina different than just black or a minority. And I know that that's um, a prevalent theme amongst a lot of Latinos where they separate themselves from just being black. Um, I did see that you refer to yourself as Afro-Dominican. So, and I do as well. Well, I typically say I'm a black woman who's Dominican, but all along the same lines. And I just wanted wanted to know, like, what are your, your thoughts on why there's the, this distinction when in all actuality, we, we are all, you know, minorities in a sense. And I know Noelle, she's passing, right? So mm -hmm. she could go that route, but um, Margarita is a little different in, mm -hmm. in her skin tone. So she would more so be looked at as a woman of color. And I was just understand, trying to understand like Lacey didn't see her daughters, even though they had different complexions as being equal to G, she saw them as being different and that distinction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in, in my experience of the Dominican Republic and in Dominican history, right? Like um, anti-Black racism and colorism are real. Um, and have perpetuated violence and death in the Dominican Republic. Um, and I have, it's, you know, I, I think that growing up, I was in an interesting position because I had my Dominican family and DR definitely a part of the African diaspora, but um, a place of deep denial about that heritage. Um, but then I had my father um, who was born here, um, who is dark skinned, um, live the life of a Black American man. So I think that his presence in my life um, perhaps made me much more attuned to the anti-Black racism in my family, um, of, of my family of Black people and Black Dominicans, um, that um, perhaps I might not have been otherwise or would have taken me longer to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in the book, um, there's definitely a way that um, the characters are all grappling with the way that proximity to whiteness is is valued, right? Like whether that's um, in being in a predominantly white space, whether it's that that's the way you look. And for Lacey May, you know, I think people do all kinds of mental acrobatics to justify their their racist ideas um and positions and i think that her marrying robbie doesn't change um the attitudes that she has and it's been interesting to hear people respond to her um it's been really interesting to hear white readers respond to her and be like lacy may is terrible i would <laughs> never want to meet lacy may wow. and i'm just sort of like interesting um i don't think lacy may is that rare of a figure like i think that um I've met Lacey Mays um, in class and then at parties, at your party, you know, or whatever it might be. <laughs> but I think it's been um, interesting. I think the ways that some readers have felt convicted by the representation of Lacey May, which I think is good. If it inspires some sort of self-reflection, then I think there's also been an ability to say like, well, she's so extreme and like takes the stance I would never take. Um, but you know, there's all this other really interesting cultural production that shows that that's not true. Like the podcast, Nice White Parents that came out last summer from the New York Times about um, integration in Brooklyn middle schools. Um, and then also 
you know, the work of Nicole Hannah Jones, which has been really influential to me. That's interesting. And, and thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to delve a little into, aside from, from writing, this is your, your second novel, you write a lot of short stories and different articles. And I came across your most recent article that um, was published in L titled Becoming a Mother While Estranged from Your Own. And one of the quotes that stood out to me when I read the article was, the ending you could not give yourself, you gave to your characters. And I wanted you to expound a little on that. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the things that I wrote about in that essay was, um, maybe a difference in the way that I see my work and the way it lands with some people. Like something that I often hear is like, oof, like this book is heavy. And I'm not out here saying like, it's light, like, you know, <laughs> but um, it's heavy and, um, you know, like the ending is tough. And I was so struck by that because I think my ending is really hopeful. So, you know, I write about flawed families. I write about, um, families that have endured tragedy or difficult circumstances and have to figure out how to put their lives back together. Um, and one of the things that's important to me is to write fiction that reflects how brutal and difficult life can be, but how people still live on and find connection um, and try to do right by one another and still miss the mark, but there's still tenderness and love. And so, you know, I think that you know, I, I'm estranged from my parents, but not from my extended family, thankfully. Um, and so, you know, I think that when people try to hold on to tenderness and love in spite of difficulty and loss and trauma, I think that that's miraculous. I think that that's a triumph. Um, it's maybe not the triumph that some people want to read about, like a 180 victory story where like everything is intact and everything is restored. Um, but I'm really interested in asking the question, like what do we get to keep? And what do we get to repair? Maybe not everything, but maybe there are some things in these very special familial bonds that we get to repair. And that work of repairing is actually miraculous. And I, I, I you use the word hopeful and I'm hopeful that as time goes on, you're able to reach a great point as well within, within your own life, be it um, no longer being estranged or if estranged is the best place where you need to be for yourself and your husband and, and your daughter. Um, you know, I, I just wish you the, the continued best with your life in terms of the path that it takes with regard to that. Oh, thank um, you for that. You're welcome. Um, where do you draw the characters in your book from? And, and I ask that because they were all so different. They, their backgrounds were different, their personalities. There were just so many different things going on in the book. And I'm, as I was reading, I was like, oh, wow. And this sister is doing this and that one. And then the two moms were, you know, ultimately they, they love their children, but they had their own inner issues and mm -hmm. you know there was just so many different parts and layers to all of the characters and i'm curious to know where do you draw that from mm -hmm. to create all these different characters what's the inspiration behind all of that mm -hmm. well i think that the characters the creating the characters feeds off each other so i do a lot of writing before i start writing a novel, like for this novel, I spent a lot of time just writing about the characters. I wasn't writing scenes. I wasn't writing chapters. I was just writing about them. I was like, what do they look like? How old are they? And the most important thing that I wrote was, how do they feel about all the other characters? So sometimes I think we think of characters like a set of innate qualities. Like we know who someone is if we know that they're shy or assertive or sensitive or talkative or whatever. And I think that that's certainly true. But say for, you know, my character Jade, if I write about how she feels about her son, 
And if I write about how she feels about her partner and write about how she feels about herself, that's also a way to get to know her. And for the sisters too, if I write about the way that the baby sister, Diane, feels about her two older sisters, Margarita and Noel, and then how she feels about her, her mother and her father and her stepfather, then like this complicated person with a set of a relate set of relationships emerges. So I think a lot about characters and context for one another. Um, and for each of them, you know, I thought I thought about the two mothers first. They're the ones who came to me for this book. I wrote a short story about Lacey May before I knew that I was going to write this novel before I was like, you know, she didn't come to me as like the woman who would oppose the immigration effort. She came to me as a woman who was struggling to keep the heat on for her three girls. And I wrote a short story about her called Cold that was published in the literary journal Quayley. And then Jade, I knew that I wanted to write about a woman wondering whether she was pregnant um, after the murder of her partner because I, I, I heard about a woman in that position um, from my husband. And I thought, what a difficult position to be in like what was this woman's life before and what a difficult question now this question of a pregnancy um, and how to understand that pregnancy and so I started with them and their situations and then who they are and what they want um, sort of grew out of that in terms of where it comes from I don't know like you know like it comes from paying attention in life like it comes from observing other people I think there's a part of me in each of my characters, but in terms of where it really comes from, I don't know. Like, I think that's maybe like the mystical, you know, part of writing where you just like channel something, you know. Your creative side is yeah. hard to work. Yeah. So in the book, you do talk about food. Um, Robbie, that's what he, he worked at with Lynette and I wanted to know what was the inspiration behind the significant food choices in the book? You mentioned Devil Foods cake, lemon bars, pimento cheese, and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is like, how do I make writing fun for myself? <laughs> it's like, like, what are the things vicariously that I get to do through the fiction? And I think one of the pleasures is writing about food. Um, that's not a very deep answer, but I think it's one of the pleasures of writing and reading. And when I was a college student, I took a nonfiction writing class with a writer named Ann Fadiman. And she did this assignment with us called the Yellow Pages Assignment. Maybe it was the White Pages Assignment. It was the White Pages Assignment, where we had to find a business in the White Pages, contact the owner, and then interview them. And I interviewed a baker in the city of New Haven who was very kind. He picked me up at four in the morning and I spent the morning watching him work in the bakery. Um, and I wrote a piece about that when I was maybe 20, 21 years old. And it always stayed with me, like watching him work, like the physical nature of the work, how wonderful everything was. At the time I was vegan, but I was like, I have to eat these croissants. <laughs> so like I tried all the things that he made and it just stayed with me. And so when I was thinking about, you know, a character who could express love through food, a character who was trying to create a better life for his family through entrepreneurship, I was like, well, if I make him a baker, <laughs> then I get to spend some time in the bakery. And, and write about food, right? Yeah. So just to make a little shift away from the book and, and get a little more personal, um, do you have any favorite writers? Mm -hmm. And, and yes. who, who you want to name just a, a few quickly? Okay. Um, a few of my favorite, like all time favorite writers, I'd say, are Edwidge Danticat, Jasmine Ward, um, Angie Cruz, Toni Morrison. For nonfiction, I really like Rebecca Solnit. Um, and Maggie Nelson, and then more contemporary writers who I really like. I really like, um, or books I've liked recently. I loved um, Queenie by Candace Cardi Williams, Want by Lynn Steger Strong, um, Cantoras by Carolina de Robertis, um, and right now I'm reading Liberty by Caitlin Greenidge, which I have not finished, but it's very good. I was just about to ask what you were reading. So you yeah. the punch Sorry. on Sorry. That's <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> what are what are you reading right now? 
you know, I, I just finished reading <laughs> what's mine and yours. And the book, the entire book club is going to kill me for this one because I should know the title at the top of my head of the new book, which is, which we're reading for the um, month of April. So I have to get right back to you. They're all like shuddering right now. I'm sure. In no, their no, no. Remember the title of the book. No. Um, I'm sure it'll pop up in the chat. <laughs> definitely. Someone will say something about that. Yeah. I know you, you, you're originally from Brooklyn mm -hmm. and you spent some time in North Carolina and the book takes place in North Carolina and you're now presently back in Brooklyn. So um, do you prefer city life or Southern living? Oh, that's a hard question. I mean, I lived in Durham for three years and I really loved it. Like I, it was a culture shock when I moved and then I grew to really love it. The reason that I came back to New York um, is because my family's here. Um, you know, my aunts are here, my cousins are here, my godmother's here. Um, and I wanted to be with my community um, for when I became a mom. And even with the pandemic, that has been a good choice. Like even with the isolation and difficulties of the pandemic um, and being in an apartment rather than a house, like it's been absolutely worth it. But I grew to really love North Carolina and I started the book after I left. And so that was also a way to keep, you know, the different places I saw and the sites close to me. So you're correct. The, the book is When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. Shame on me. <laughs> I'll, I'll be cracking that open tomorrow. Yeah, you've got time. You've got I'm time. Reading, yes. Yeah. It, it's our April book. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to it. It's been getting good reviews um, as well. So you mentioned, even though it's during the pandemic and you were here in New York, it was better being with your family. How has dealing and coping with with the pandemic been um leaving North Carolina you were had more space and now in an apartment and you know New York City was hit really hard how was it working in your your space and and just trying to navigate during the pandemic as you were working on mm -hmm. a novel and just day to day with your mm -hmm. daughter and just trying mm -hmm. to trying to survive mm -hmm. I mean, it was bad, Like it was, it was really hard. Um, you know, um, my, my aunt was caring for my daughter um, before the pandemic, which was really beautiful. Um, and then that stopped and I was on deadline for what's mine and yours. My daughter was under a year old. And I was also teaching. Um, and my, my husband was a part of the city response during the surge. Um, so it was really tough. It was a really tough and intense time. And I, I, a friend recently said this thing to me that I thought was so moving. She was like, um, you know, that saying it takes a village to raise a child. And she was like part of the, um, the stress and hardship of, of contemporary motherhood is that, you know, an individual mother is expected to be a village. Um, and I definitely felt that way during lockdown. Um, very isolated, it's very difficult. And then also doing this work of writing at a time when we were talking about essential work and there was like nothing essential about my fiction writing, you know, but I had to do it. I had to do it not only because I was on deadline and I was under, con like I had a contract that said I had to do it, but because writing is a part of who I am and it's part of how I know how to live. So it was also a time that was, it was very difficult to make space to honor my own kind of needs and requirements for something that isn't essential. Um, and it isn't essential, like it is, I think, um, powerful and influential and meaningful, um, but is different um, than say working in healthcare. So I have, you know, it was a difficult time practically, but then also in terms of like my reckoning with what it means to have chosen to spend my life making things up and writing fiction. And, and doing a phenomenal job at it during the time. Thank you. So July, 2020, which was in the midst of, of the, the pandemic in New York, you know, was really in the thick of it. So, I mean, 
thank you to your husband for just being out there at the front lines. It was a very scary time for the yeah. world, um, all of us. You wrote an article in New York Magazine um, titled, How to Write When You're Not Sure About Anything. And you mentioned attachment theory and trusting others when you're dropping your daughter off at daycare and your distress. And one of the things you said in the article, I'm just gonna read it really quickly is, perhaps the trouble with my gut isn't that I don't trust myself, but that I have trouble trusting others. Unlike my daughter, I don't believe the world is a safe, secure place. And surely it isn't, as many of us knew long before the crisis of COVID-19 and the tragic murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Richard Brooks. In an uncertain world, books have offered me great solace. And I just wanted to ask you, how are you feeling about everything that continues to, to go on in the world today and, and having a young child that is growing up in this world, what do you think you'll be able to provide to her just to help her navigate all of these things that are happening? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think are about we? it every no, I think it I think about it every day. Um, and you know, like this may be one a question where like although I am a novelist, I feel like this is a question that I like want and need help from elders on. Like, you know, like I, um, one of the things that's important to me is making sure that home, like how many, how many things I can control? I can control what my home is like. Um, and Caitlin Greenidge actually wrote a wonderful piece for the Times Magazine at the end of last year um, about um, one of the first, Black women zookeepers in the country, I think in Baltimore. It's really wonderful. I forget the name of the woman, but in that article, she writes about how this woman was a mother and the power of motherhood because you can create a family where you have a lot of influence. I think about that all the time in my daughter's life, like how much power and influence I have over how she understands herself and the world, maybe parents of teenagers out there are like, just wait, you know, but like as for right now, I have quite a lot of power. And so I think a lot about how to make home um, a place that's nurturing and that's safe and where she learns like what she deserves and what she's entitled to um, because the world won't always reinforce that, um, might work to undermine that. So I think a lot about that, but I, I also think like I have a lot to learn about how to equip my child. And I feel like I learned by talking to, to elders and to, to other mothers. I don't know entirely like what to do or how to, how to process. So I feel that I turn to others quite a lot for guidance actually. And, and you mentioned that you have a large support system here. You have your aunts and your godmother. So I'm sure that those women in your life will be able to um, assist and, and guide you. And they're considered a part of a part of your elders, I, um, yes. I assume. So that that's yes. that's a great thing. To oh, shift Mary the Wilson, that's great in the chat. That's the name of the first black zookeeper that uh, Caitlin Green wrote about, okay. Mary Wilson. Oh, and yeah, there's a link as well. It's a great essay. Definitely, I'm going to read it. Thanks for sharing that. When did you know that you wanted to become a writer? So mm -hmm. back to basics with the questions. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting. I think I knew from a very young age, but I think it took me a while to be honest about it and really admit it to myself. So, you know, I was an avid reader and I often wrote to imitate the books that I love. Um, and so, you know, I have a box in my office filled with papers and notebooks with short stories and novels. And it was mostly fiction that I wrote. Like I, I journaled a little bit, but I wasn't a big journaler. I wrote some bad poems, but I wasn't really a poet. It was always fiction. Um, so it was very important to me. And I wrote, you know, I wrote my first book in high school. I wrote a collection of short stories that I like bound at Kinko's and saved. Um, but I, you know, when I went to college, I declared that I was pre-med 
And I even applied to med school and I think that, um, and got in and then didn't go. Um, and I think that that was because I didn't feel that I had permission to sort of chart this creative path when I had so much opportunity before me, sort of like had, I could do something more like stable and secure and you know make choices that people for generations in my family before me would have loved to be able to make. And then I was like, I'm gonna write fiction. You know, like it took me a long time to admit that to myself. And, I, and fortunately it's gone well, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I knew that I was gonna do it no matter how it was gonna go. Like, you know, I wasn't like, I'm gonna do this because one day I'll be a New York Times bestseller. Not at all. That's like a recipe for unhappiness, I think. Um, but I, I did it because it was how I wanted to spend my life and my time. But it wasn't until I was in, I think, my mid-20s, early, early mid-20s, that I was like, this is the thing that I'm going to really devote myself to. Beautiful. Are you, just to segue in, into continuing with discussing your, your writing, is there something else that you're working on now that you can share with us? Mm -hmm. I can share what my dream of the third novel is. And it's okay. also like the book that will, I'll write. Like there are some writers who have like dozens of ideas that they pick up and put down. I'm not that writer. I don't have dozens of ideas. Maybe I do. And I decide to put them all in one book, which is how you get a book like what's mine and yours um, with different timelines and different characters. But I sort of just commit to the idea and then think that once I'm in that situation or premise, there's a lot of room to look around. So this is the book that I will write yet, although I'm still in the dreaming phase. Um, I wanna write a book about two lifelong friends who are both pregnant at the same time and decide to move to the same Brooklyn neighborhood to be near one another and raise their girls together. Um, but then once they give birth, uh, all the differences in their lives become all the more apparent. They're in really different marriages. They've made really different choices. One of them is really wealthy and a travel writer. Um, and one of them is broke. Um, and being becoming mothers make them confront all of the ways that their lives have taken different paths. And then they decide to put their daughters um, in a nanny share together and all kinds of things happen. I can already tell I'm going to enjoy reading that one as well. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a, a question that came in and it's, has there been a novel that you've read that most resembled your own life? In other words, has there been a novel that most reflected a piece of your experiences? Is there mm. room for new novelists? Mm. Yeah. I love this question um, because I think that that's one of the amazing things about fiction. Like you can see your life reflected in perhaps a really unlikely text that speaks really meaningfully to you. Um, I think the first book that that really happened for me big time was Breath Eyes Memory by Edwidge Danticat. Like that book, I read it when I was 14 or 15, a teacher gave it to me. Um, it's set in Brooklyn. It's um, about, a Haitian woman and her daughter and moves back and forth between Brooklyn and Haiti. And it was the first book I read that was really interested that, and that I understood was interested in national history and how that really informed the life of one family and how like familial memory of what happened in like the last place, the former place is always present in the new place, like as, a, as an immigrant story, as a difficult mother-daughter story, as a, as a story of coming of age, that book was huge for me. Um, and I think that there are a lot of parallels between my first book, Halsey Street, and Breath Eyes Memory that weren't intentional. But um, I like to think that book is speaking to Breath Eyes Memory. Um, and I was honored to learn that Edwige Dantica has actually read Halsey Street, which was wow. given to her as a gift by a family member. Um, so I was very honored um, when I learned that. Oh, that's a, that must have been an amazing feeling to have that yeah. experience. Yeah. So you just, this is your second novel, and we want to know, how can the writing community 
rally around you. It's, it's a pandemic at this time. So what type of support can, can one give you during this time? You're not really able to do in-person book signings and things of that nature. So someone would like to know um, how the community rallies and, and shows support for you in particular during these times. That is such a thoughtful, generous question. Um, so thank you for that. Well, I mean, this is amazing. Like this, this platform and this opportunity to share is amazing. I never take for granted that someone wants to read my book, let alone hear me say things about it. Um, there's so many good books to read, right? Like so many good books that people have recommended to me that I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe next month, like maybe later, you know? So I feel honored. Um, and grateful whenever somebody picks it up. Um, Goodreads reviews are helpful. Amazon reviews are helpful. Word of mouth is really powerful, especially at this point, like where all the like really big publicity for the book has happened, like in the first launch months. And what really sustains the lives of books at this point is like, it's sort of like the momentum it builds, right? Like people read it because they saw someone on the train reading it or their sister read it or, you know, um, so like word of mouth and talking about the book with people, sharing it on social media, all of that um, is helpful if someone wants to, you know, sort of like do more than what they've already done, which is like buy and read the book or get it from the library and read it. So I appreciate that. And I think also, you know, like continuing to buy and support and read books by women of color. Like, even if it's not like my book, you know, like as a um, sort of like we vote with our dollars. I was part of an event last night where someone was like, borrow, borrow books by white authors from the library and like buy books by people of color at your independent bookshop. And like people do what they can, right? Like many people get all their books from the libraries and our library systems are great. Um, but I think that, you know, we vote with our dollars so as much as we're able to do that if we are it's a good thing i agree and as for authors and as you know uh go on girl book club uh all of our books that we read throughout the year are written by minority authors that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on just to support mm -hmm. people like you and i'm looking forward to getting the reading list committee to get this book on our list <laughs> As well, I'm going to push for it because I really enjoyed Halsey Street, as obviously all of the members did. So I wanted to ask you if you could have your own book club. Um, mm. Longer, we have different book clubs and we, we have separate chapters across the United States and in each chapter there are members, at least four, maximum of 12. So if you could have your own chapter in your book club, who would you like to be a member of your book club? Oh, who would I like to be a member of my book club? Like anyone in the world would be, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I would really love to be a part of a multi-generational book club. Um, that would be amazing to have um, all different, like women of all different ages in the book club. I mean, I would love to have, in, it is interesting. Like I think about, uh, I'd love to have a book club with some women in my family, um, many of whom are not avid readers, but read my books. Um, and then they enjoy my books. And I'm like, there's so many other good books out there that you might enjoy. Um, so yeah, some of the women in my family, because I do find that, you know, like, every time someone responds to a book, they're really speaking from such a deep and intimate place. And so it's a way of learning more about the people who are there. So some of my family members, and then all of the, all of the women writers of color that I know are so busy and always hustling. And like none of us are in book clubs as far as I know in my sort of cohort and um, group, uh, but we all read each other's books. Um, so I would love a book club um, with other women of color, maybe on like second novels, first or second novels, because we're in sort of like similar places in our career. It might be fun. Oh, that's that's really cool. Uh, GOG is multi-generational, which is really a, a great experience for all of us 
to be able to see the different views. Um, and we even have the junior GOG now for the young tweens and teens, and they're reading young adult books. So oh, it, I didn't know that. That's yeah. wonderful. So that's that's a, a new addition. And, and the girls are really excited and they have their own social media pages. And, and it's just really good to get uh, young people involved in reading because it's just a great thing overall. Reading helps open up the mind and it takes you so many different places. If you could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with any writer, living or dead, and you've probably heard this question before, it's, it's a popular one, who would it be and why? Oh, no, I mean, I mean, I, I think that this is a great question. Um, it would definitely be Zora Neale Hurston. Like, I think that she would have really good gossip, like really good <laughs> stories about other writers and her time. Um, I think that she would have amazing advice and insight about publishing and life. Um, and, you know, like, uh, their Eyes Are Watching God is a book that I read for the first time um, when I was like 14 and I read it and I was like, it was good. And then, and then I read it again when I was, you know, 18 or 19, I was like, this is the best book I've ever read. And then it's the book that I've reread the most often um, and it's very important to me. Um, and so I would also love to just be in her presence. I'd love to be in her presence too. Yeah, she's just like brilliant and irreverent and wonderful. I feel like that would just be amazing. So you, I, I heard when you said you wrote your first book when you were in high school, will that ever surface anywhere? Is that something that we'll be able to see somewhere, read at any point in time, do you think? It's for the best if nobody ever sees that. <laughs> like It's just like, you know, like I'm proud of it, like for what it is, like there's a part of me that thinks like, that's remarkable. And like a testament to my passion that I went home, I did my homework and then I like wrote stories, you know, like I think it's a beautiful testament to the path I was on. In terms of how good the stories are, like, you know, <laughs> it was the same. It was me figuring things out, you know? And like, I think about, I'm not an athlete, but I think about writing as like working a set of muscles. So it's like I was training, like I was practicing, I was working muscles um, that I use now as a writer. But the stories, you know, they're not, um, they're not gold. You're probably being a little hard on yourself. <laughs> I'm sure my, like myself would most likely enjoy reading it. Something oh, to, thank you something, for that. Something to consider down the line. It could just be something that you maybe blog about or just throw out there um, for us to just enjoy. Maybe hold us over when you're done with your third novel and beginning on the fourth one. Well, I appreciate that, Eliana. So I guess we're pretty much winding down um, the conversation. And I really wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We all enjoyed Halsey Street. What's mine and yours is it just, I kept on flipping the pages and um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm standing right now a little and I'm not that type of person, but I was very excited to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you. It, it really means a lot to me. Um, to be able to share this moment with you. So I wanted to thank you for, for that as well and giving us your time. And we definitely look forward to your future works that you have. Thank, thank you so much. This has been my pleasure. And I really appreciate hearing that because one of the strange things about these virtual events is that there are so many people who I can't see, you know? And it's not like a bookstore event where someone can come up to you and say like, the book touched me in this way, or this relates to my family story, or I'm a writer too, or whatever it might be. So to be able to see your face and hear your voice and have that connection sort of beyond a, a DM on Instagram or an email, although I appreciate those too. There's something I think really special about 
seeing and hearing a person. So I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, you can ask any, I loved Halsey Street so much. And I think it was just, you know, I connected with it in so many different ways and just reading about the differences, you know, the mother and Penelope and Mireya and, and their relationship and, you know, the relationship with the dad and just so many different things we don't have time to delve into on that, but it really touched me. So when I found out that you had uh, another novel coming out, I got really excited. And then when I found out that we were having a conversation, I said, can I do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. This is my first conversation. So I was a little nervous at first, but then I said, you know what? She's my manita and I'm just going to go on there and chit chat with her and have a good time. So I just- You did an amazing job. Thank, thank you for all your care and thoughtfulness. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so with that said, um, everyone, what's mine and yours is available at- all of the local bookstores, it's available online on all of the different platforms and you can even access it um, at your local library. I yes. suggest you go out and read it. And in order to support Naima, write a review on Goodreads, Amazon or any other platform just to help boost her um, strength in numbers. And as black women, we, and men, I'm sure we have some men out there, um, we just need to continue to support one another, um, especially during these trying times. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us. I hope that you all have a wonderful evening and a blessed weekend. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you everybody for being here. Okay. Thank you, blonde girl. Good night. Good night. Oh my God.